question for you all today. Has anybody here ever experienced food poisoning? A number of you have, yeah, and I have twice. Uh, and if you've had that awful experience, you know how bad it is. Uh, I've never felt worse in my entire life, I think, than when I, than when I had that. But one of the effects it has on me is that um, I'm very particular about expiration dates when I go grocery shopping for food. And uh, I check the dates on everything now, especially milk. Uh, I need to buy milk with an expiration date far enough in advance so I have time to drink it all. But uh, sometimes I don't drink it all and it goes bad. Have you ever smelled sour milk, really, really sour milk? That's like the second worst experience I think a person can ever have. I mean, that's really, really bad. Wouldn't it be great if we never had to worry about expiration dates? Wouldn't it be wonderful to never have to worry about smelling sour milk again? Well, actually, there is a kind of milk that will never go out of date or spoil. And Peter, the Apostle Peter, talks about that in 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 2. We read this. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. In the context of this verse, Peter is talking about the word of God as pure spiritual milk. That kind of milk has no expiration date. It will never go bad. It lasts forever. And just two verses before this, um, Peter quotes uh, Isaiah 40, verse 8, where Isaiah writes, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. So God's word is pure spiritual milk that we should crave like a baby craves physical milk. And this spiritual milk never goes bad. It will always be good to drink. It endures forever. Well, right about now, some of you might be thinking there is a misprint in my sermon title for this morning, and if you saw it up there, you'll notice that it said the expired Bible. Uh, am I saying that the Bible has gone out of date? No, I'm not saying that at all, but in order to understand what I do mean, uh, we need to look at the Apostle Paul's second letter to Timothy in chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. Paul writes to Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You see, going out of date is not the only meaning for the word expire. Expire also means to breathe out, to exhale. And so Paul is telling us here that all scripture has been expired or breathed out by God. But why does it say breathed out here in the NIV, which is what I'm reading from, when most other translations of the Bible use the word inspired or inspiration in this verse? Let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, where the NIV says all scripture is God breathed, we read all scripture is inspired by God in the New American Standard, the Christian Standard, the New Revised Standard, the New Living Translation. All scripture is given by inspiration in the New King James and the King James. Um, why does it say God breathed in the NIV? Well, for one thing, the word inspire is really, I think, too broad a term to reflect the actual meaning of the Greek word here. For example, we might say that an artist goes to Hawaii and is inspired to paint beaches and mountains, or uh, a person might go see a classical guitarist perform and then is inspired to take guitar lessons. Inspiration usually means to be motivated in a strong way to do something. But that is clearly not what the Apostle Paul is talking about in this verse. Paul is not saying that the writers of the Bible, or even God himself, felt strongly motivated to write the scriptures. In the original Greek, the word that is translated God-breathed or inspired is theopneustos. And so I've written it up here in Greek on top and then changed the letters into English so it might make a little bit more sense, but maybe not much uh, to you. But um, this Greek word theopneustos comes from two Greek words. Uh, on the one side is thea, and then neustos. The word thea in Greek comes from the Greek word theos, meaning God. And the word neustos comes from the Greek word pneuma, referring to the movement of air, like wind or breath. Uh, in fact, we use this word pneuma quite often in English, right? A pneumatic drill is a drill that's powered by air, right? Or uh, if you get pneumonia, your breathing equipment, the lungs fill with fluid. A pneumonectomy would be a removal of part or all of your lung. So theopneustos is a combination of the words God and breath. So it literally means God breathed. So by using this word, Paul is telling us that the Bible has been breathed out by God. 
By this, Paul is saying that God is the ultimate source of the content of Scripture. This is what is meant when we talk about the doctrine of inspiration. God is the source of what is written in the Bible. The Apostle Peter also talks about um, God the Holy Spirit as the source of Scripture. In 2 Peter 1.21, we read this, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit in some way guided and led the writers to write what they wrote. And yet, it appears the Holy Spirit did not mechanically dictate the words. Why would I say that? Because uh, when we read the Bible, we easily see that the interest, the personality, and the style of each writer is reflected in their writing. For example, Luke is often concerned with historical facts and things of a medical nature. Paul's, is, uh, his Greek is that of a scholar. He loses, uses really long sentences and, and big words. Uh, and, and in contrast to that, John's Greek is very simple and much easier to understand. And on top of that, the Bible has a lot of different um, genres and literary devices like poetry, historical narrative, letters, prophecy, metaphors, and hyperbole. So it's clear that God uses the skills of each of the writers to communicate his message to us. So here's a good definition of what we mean when we talk about the Bible being inspired. The Holy Spirit guided the biblical writers so that writing in their own individual styles, the result was God's intended and specific message to humanity. But there's an objection that we might hear from the critic of the Bible or the skeptic. Just because the Bible claims to be inspired by God doesn't mean it really is. Anybody can claim anything, right? So how do we know for sure that God really is the source of the Bible? Well, I think probably the best evidence for that would be the record that the Bible has of fulfilled prophecies. There are literally hundreds of specific and detailed prophecies in the Bible that have come true. And many of these prophecies were made hundreds of years before they happened. So it wasn't a matter of the prophet making an educated guess based on the conditions of his time. For example, the ancient kingdoms and cities of Babylon, Nineveh, Tyre, and Edom were all prophesy prophesied to be destroyed. And ultimately they were because they tried to exterminate the Jews, God's holy people. 150 years before it happened, Isaiah predicted that a ruler named Cyrus would authorize the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and it happened. But even more fascinating, when you think of Jesus, uh, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, here's what the Bible predicted about him, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be from the tribe of Judah, and in particular from the line of David. He would perform miracles, he would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey, he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, he'd be pierced in his side, he'd have his hands and his feet pierced, others would cast lots for his clothing, he would die with the wicked, be buried in a rich man's tomb, and he would rise from the dead, and hundreds more. All that hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. How do you explain that? Lucky guess? I don't think so. Only the Bible's divine origin can explain its perfect track record of predictive prophecy. But again, the, the skeptic might say, well, wait, wait a minute, you know, we, we have a lot of modern day psychics, right, and prophets. Haven't they made accurate pr predictions as well? And uh, well, perhaps uh, some of you who are a little older, maybe the most famous psychic in the 20th century was a woman by the name of Jean Dixon. And some of you might remember her. She gained a tremendous notoriety by predicting the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, who was elected in 1960. In 1956, four years before that, Dixon predicted that the 1960 presidential election would be won by a Democrat, which it was, who would then go on to be assassinated or die in office. Everybody's impressed with that, right? What a lot of people don't realize is that as the 1960 election got closer, she changed her mind and she said that Nixon would actually win the election. So uh, that, that, that wasn't publicized very much. But uh, the rest of her record is really quite flawed. Um, it turns out that on uh, October 19th of 1968, she stated that President Kennedy's widow, Jacqueline, was not considering remarriage. And the next day, she married Aristotle Onassis. Uh, she predicted that World War III would begin in 1958, and she predicted that Russia would put the first man on the moon. So uh, I think her record speaks for itself. 
Uh, more recently, uh, a woman by the name of Sylvia Brown gained quite a bit of notoriety for correctly predicting that Arnold Schwarzenegger would run for political office, that was before his campaign for governor, that uh, two people would be arrested for the Oklahoma City bombings, and that Madonna would have another child by someone other than her then current husband. And all of those things came true. Well, you could probably be pretty good at guessing to get, to get those correct. But uh, what's really telling is the times that she was wrong, uh, and sadly so. In 1999, Brown said that six-year-old Opal Jennings, who had disappeared a month earlier, had been forced into slavery and was living in Japan. Well, later that year, an autopsy of Jennings' remains found that she had died within hours of her abduction, sadly. In 2002, Sylvia Brown claimed that a woman named Holly Crewson, who had disappeared seven years earlier in 1995, was still alive. And yet her remains were found, and it turned out she was killed back in 1996. But what's kind of sad and humorous at the same time is that this so-called prophet, Sylvia Brown, was married four times. Now, I mean, if you're pretty good at predicting the future, don't you know that this marriage is not going to work out? <laughs> I mean, you'd figure at least once she would get that right. Well, she claimed that she would die at the age of 88 and was 77 when she passed away. Not a very impressive record, to say the least. And the same is true for all so-called psychics and prophets. All of them have been wrong about many things. But by contrast, with its hundreds of predictions, the Bible has never been wrong, and that can only be explained because it comes from God. Now, because the Bible's inspired, or more correctly, expired by God, uh, certain things follow from that. If God is the true source of the Bible, then how many errors and mistakes would, be, would we expect to find in the Bible? Well, only as many as God would make, a big fat zero, right? Theologians refer to this as the inerrancy of the Bible. Uh, this is a definition that's as good as any when it comes to the inerrancy of the Bible, very basic. It says, when all the facts are known, the Bible will be shown to be true in all that it affirms. And this is what the Bible's talking about when it speaks of the truthfulness of God's words. For example, in Proverbs 30, verse 5, we read this, every word of God is flawless. Speaking through the, Isaiah, uh, through, through the prophet Isaiah, God declares in Isaiah 45, 19, I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. And in the New Testament, in John 17, 7, 17 uh, Jesus is praying, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. But it's important to realize that the Bible's inerrancy is not negated by imprecision due to everyday uh, sayings like um, the sun is rising, right? Um, even though it's actually the Earth's movement that makes the sun appear to rise, when the weatherman talks about the sunrise, we don't say, oh, he's an error, you know, because he didn't get it right. Uh, we use things like that all the time, and so do the biblical writers. Um, they uh, often round off numbers um, they use unusual grammar at times. They might give alternate spelling of cities. They make, might, uh, excuse me, they might make loose or free quotations uh, from the Old Testament. But the issue is not whether a statement complies with our modern standards for precision, but whether there's truthfulness in what is being said. But it's also important to remember that um, when it comes to this idea of inerrancy or inspiration, only the original writing was inspired by God and is therefore inerrant. And you know, we don't have the original writings of scripture. I don't know if, you, if you're aware of that. Um, they do not exist or we haven't found them, but we don't have the actual original writing. What we have are copies of what was originally written. And those copies and translations were not inspired. As a result, we have found that copy copyists often make mistakes when they're copying, just like you or I would, right? When we copy things by hand. Um, but it's because we have so many thousands of manuscripts that have been found, we can identify where those copy mistakes are. And um, let me uh, show you how that's done. Uh, slightly oversimplified, but let's just say we had uh, four different manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, from Philippians 4.13. And in these four statements, there are either misspellings or maybe there's a hole in the, in the you know, papyrus and we can't quite make it out. But uh, none of those four statements contain the original message. But is there any doubt in your mind what the, what the original said based on these four statements? 
No, you can see it. It's, I can do all things. See, when you compare the manuscripts together, the correct ones fill in for the errors. And so when you do this with thousands of manuscripts, it's just easy to see where the copyists made mistakes, and we can easily get back to what the original said. So not having the original is not a reason to panic at all. Uh, God has blessed us with thousands upon thousands of ancient manuscripts, and so we can easily determine what the original said. Um, because of this, we are over 99.5% certain of what the original said. There is a little bit of a room where we can't quite determine uh, what maybe the actual uh, said, but those are almost all, all of those ref uh, involved um, just different spellings of proper names or different spellings of cities. None of them affect any doctrine that we believe whatsoever. So we can be very, very confident that when we read our Bible, it's exactly what was, what was written. And yet critics of the Bible still aren't satisfied. They, uh, they often accuse the Bible of contradicting itself. You know, we hear that all the time. There are so many contradictions in the Bible. Well, um, I don't have time uh, to go through a lot of those, but I do want to give you one example of what is called a, a contradiction, but really is not. Um, if we look at these two verses, 2 Samuel 24, 9 says this, Joab reported the number of fighting men to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword. And then in 1 Chronicles 21, 5, we read this. Joab reported the number of fighting men to David. In all Israel, there are 1,100,000 men who could handle the sword. So the people who question the Bible say, well, wait a minute. Uh, the numbers don't, uh, don't match. There's 300,000 more uh, in the Chronicles verse. And so this is clearly a contradiction. But notice the addition of the words able-bodied in the 2 Samuel verse. You see, um, these two verses are talking about two different groups of men. Uh, able-bodied men are um, sometimes, that, that word able-bodied is sometimes translated as valiant in other, in other versions. And so that's what the Hebrew word can mean, valiant, able-bodied. And we get more of a definition of what that term means when we look at 1 Chronicles 5.18. Here's what that says. The Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had 44,760 men ready for military service. Able-bodied men, there it is, who could handle shield and sword, who could use a bow, and who were trained for battle. So these able-bodied men are not the regular fighters. They're more highly skilled. They're the elite fighters who have been uh, well-trained and, and much more experienced. So the Chronicles verse, 1.1 million, that's talking about everybody in the army, whereas the second Samuel verse is only talking about those 800,000 uh, valiant or able-bodied men who could do all these other things as well. So when you really look at the text, there's really not a contradiction. There's a very good explanation of it. Um, there have been some great resources that have been written about this. I have one with me. Um, this is a book called When Critics Ask by Norm Geisler and Tom Howe, where they go through every book of the Bible and they take what critics have called the contradiction and they give a very, very reasonable explanation like I just did uh, as to why there really are no contradictions at all. Another one would be uh, the Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties by Gleason Archer. But um, the bottom line is that there are no bona fide errors in the Bible. That's just the way it is. But because the Bible has been breathed out by God and is therefore inerrant, it follows that it serves as our final authority. Since it conveys his message, the Bible carries the same weight that God would command if he himself were speaking to us personally. So whatever contradicts the Bible contradicts God. It's just that simple. That's why we have to turn to, God, to the Bible as our ultimate guide in all matters. The Bible is the expression of God's will to us, and therefore it possesses the right to define what we are to believe and how we are to conduct ourselves. We have no right to disagree with it. So my question is this, how authoritative is the Bible in your life? Do you seek to understand it so you can live by it? How much time do you really spend studying the Bible? See, if we're to be serious about our faith, we must be passionate about learning God's word. I want to take just a second now, and, and I want to draw a really fascinating parallel between Jesus and the Bible, because both Jesus and the Bible are actually revelations of God. <clears throat> right? Jesus, in uh, human form, came to show us 
uh, what God is like. And the Bible, in the same way in written form, shows us uh, what God is like. Most of you are familiar with how John begins his gospel, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And a few verses later, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is called the Word. And of course, the Bible is called the Word. Uh, next, we see that Jesus had human parents. The Bible had human authors. Uh, next, we see that Jesus' physical origin was due to the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, as Luke puts it. And the Bible, uh, its origin is due to the Holy Spirit's guidance over the biblical writers. And finally, Jesus was without sin, and the Bible is without error. But I want to return now to our text for this morning, uh, back in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture, not part of it, but all of it, is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Because the, the scriptures come from God, Paul says they are useful. And I think this English word useful is a little bit too weak. Uh, the Greek here uh, uh, is a word that means valuable or profitable, and some other translations actually translate it that way. In fact, it's the same word that's translated as value in 1 Timothy 4.8, which says godliness has value for all things. So Paul is saying that all scripture is valuable or profitable and useful for what? For teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. First one is teaching. Is your life, uh, in your life, are you consistently being taught by the word of God? See, if you're to be taught by scripture, then you have to study it for yourself. Small group, Bible class, uh, in your own devotion time, but you have to make this time to study the Word. You must actively pursue the teaching of Scripture if it's to be of use to you. And as Mark mentioned earlier uh, in the service, our church here offers plenty of opportunities in small groups and Bible classes to, um, to do this, to really learn God's Word. And I, I can't urge you more strongly to take advantage of these opportunities. They're, they're there, and this is what the Lord wants from you. So I, I really, really encourage you, if you are not part of that, to do so uh, right away. Next, the Bible is valuable for rebuking. This deals with identifying false teaching, uh, discerning truth from error. Satan is very clever at disguising false teaching. And I think that's one reason that the cults and the churches with faulty doctrine are growing so steadily. We need to be sharp in our understanding of the word so we can discern truth from error. Well, next it says the Bible is to be used for correcting, and this deals with correcting sinful or ungodly behavior. It gives us standards of right and wrong that we need to adjust our life to. It also means to straighten out misunderstandings of um, doctrine. If we don't understand something or we're understanding it in a different way, um, this, the Bible is used to correct that. The Bible is to be our standard of thinking so that our thinking and behavior can come more in line with what the Lord desires. Well, fourthly, the Bible is to be used for training in righteousness. Scripture shows us how to please God and glorify God by righteous living. But notice that this requires training. It doesn't come naturally or easily for us. We're fallen. We have a hard time with that. Training means discipline, hard work, and effort. And that's what we ought to be pouring into our faith as we study God's word. If you want to please God, you have to work at it. The result of all this, Paul states in verse 17, added on there, it says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, by knowing and understanding scripture, believers become equipped for doing good in God's eyes. If you don't know and understand scripture, you're not going to be equipped and you won't live the kind of life that God desires from you. Well, with this foundation of what scripture is, Paul gives further instruction in chapter four in the first two verses where he writes, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word and be prepared in season and out of season, that means when it's convenient and when it's not convenient, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. You'll notice here that Paul does not simply command Timothy to preach, but to preach the word. 
You know, there is way too much preaching in far too many churches today that is not centered and grounded in God's word. Preaching should not be uh, simply uh, good advice or consist of moral platitudes or personal opinions or messages designed to make you feel warm and fuzzy. The church is to preach the word in all of its truth. And that means encouraging as well as convicting and correcting and instructing. But always gently and carefully and patiently, not forgetting that we are one family and we ought to be treating each other as such. So why is it so important to preach the word in all of its truth? Well, Paul tells us in the next two verses, in three and four. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. If that was true in Paul's day, it's even more true today. What people want to hear and what the Bible says are often two very different things. Churches today are filled with people who reject parts of the Bible and some of the doctrines that maybe they don't like so much. They'd rather feel good than to be made spiritually good. They want their self-esteem fed rather than their hearts cleansed. And you know, it's, it's really shocking to me to see how much culture has influenced the beliefs of so many people who call themselves Christians. Today, there is so much that our, consider, that our culture considers right or normal, which the Bible teaches is wrong. Our moral standards of right and wrong are not to be found on TV or in the movies or on social media. On any issue, we need to go to the Bible first for guidance as to what we're to believe and how we're to live. God's standards of right and wrong will be the basis of his judgment in the end. Paul has just reminded us that Jesus is coming to judge us. And that standard to be used is God's standard, not the culture's standard, not people's opinions of what's right and wrong, but God's standards of right and wrong will be the basis of his judgment in the end. Pray that we will never comp compromise the truth here in this church when we preach it, when we teach it, or in our conversations about it. Well, finally, in verse 5, Paul says, But you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, Discharge all the duties of your ministry. The fact that when people inside or outside the church turn away from the truth, Timothy should not be deterred. Neither should we. It simply means we need to be more determined to proclaim the truth of God's word. I like the way uh, Bible commentator John Stott puts it, uh, his thoughts on this verse. He says this, Those difficult days in which it was hard to gain a hearing for the gospel were not to discourage Timothy nor deter him from his ministry, nor to induce him to trim his message to suit his hearers, and still less to silence him altogether, but rather to spur him on to preach all the more. And it should be the same with us. The harder the times and the more deaf the people, the clearer and more persuasive our proclamation must be. And I could not agree with that more. Well, today we've covered a lot of ground in terms of what the Bible actually is. Um, here are the things that I'd love for you to take away from this message this morning. First, the source of the Bible is God himself. It has been breathed out by him, making the Bible his direct message to us. Secondly, therefore, the Bible is without error. Since God doesn't make errors, the Bible doesn't have any. Therefore, the Bible is authoritative for us. The Bible in its entirety must inform our thinking. We cannot ignore the parts we don't like, but we must accept all of it and let that become part of us. Therefore, we need to study it. If you take your faith in Jesus seriously, don't let life go by without knowing what the Bible has to teach you. The Bible is precious because it is a gift from God himself. He didn't have to give it to us, but he graciously has. And I pray the scriptures will be your guide and ultimate source of truth. The Bible has come to us from God, so diligently pursue, pursue your understanding of it so that you can live your life according to it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Bible, your message to us, that you went through the process, Lord, of giving us exactly what you wanted us to know about you, about life, about right and wrong, 
about so many issues that we encounter as we live our lives. And Lord, I pray we would not be a people that ignore it. I pray that we would be a people that, that, that don't think, well, we know enough about it, so we're okay. Give us a heart of, of passion. Give us a heart of desire, Lord, to learn your word, to study it, to come closer to you as we do that, Lord. Uh, draw us to you through your word, I pray, as we make a diligent effort to learn more about you through it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.